Hi, uh, and thank you very much for joining us. A very warm well welcome to the CTS Net, your reporter, uh, roundtable discussion. We are at the SDS 2017 in Houston, and uh, there are multiple uh, important topics that are discussed during this meeting. However, one of the topics I thought it would be good to pan a, a, a nice uh, panel for that. It's a controversial topic. It's, it's on sutureless aortic valve in bicuspid aortic uh, valve surgery. And for this, I've lined up for you today, Eric Rosselli, who is on my left hand here. He's from uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and next to him is Vinod Turani. He's from the Emory uh, University School of Medicine from the US, and far there is my friend uh, Malak Schwester from uh, Hanover, Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Right, I'm going to cut to the chase. Uh, this is a controversial topic. Um, we know that sutureless valves are gaining momentum. Uh, reason being is because they are fast uh, to implant, they are reproducible, and uh, they, cross the, they cut down the cross clamp time and the carpalmonary bypass time. We've seen in the literature a few trends that are used in, in different uh, settings, uh, in, in bicuspid aortic valve, redo aortic valve surgery, and so on and so forth. However, there is a, there is a uh, controversy around, around its use in bicuspid aortic valve, um, and for this reason, uh, we'd like to take your opinion on that. I'll start with you, Malak, because you had a, recently a, a, a good study that we all learned from. It's the Cavalier trial, uh, which you published recently. Um, and I've noticed that in that trial, you've managed to exclude the congenital bicuspid uh, cohort. Could you tell us why? No, we didn't manage to do it. Actually, as a part of the CE certification trial, uh, it was an exclusion criteria because with the sutureless valves, because there are no sutures, uh, there has to be, the, the aortic annulus has to be circular. So for that trial, we said, okay, we do not take this patient group. But it doesn't mean that you cannot take uh, bicuspid uh, valve patients uh, for sutureless valves. The only thing is that you have to then make the, the annulus of the patient circular, whether by putting some annulus stitches or whatever, then if it is circular, then there's no problem in that. Actually, two days ago, we saw a nice video from Eric showing that how to do the, put these sutures, and then if you do that, I think the results are equally good. So as long as you do that, then it is fine. Great. Vinod, we, we've heard Malak saying something about that the annulus needs to be circular, and I know from the literature that there are many, many authorities or many people are mentioning that the, actually the annulus isn't circular, it's ellipsoid, <coughs> and hence they've devised their own uh, uh, exclusion criteria, which is one of them, is that if the annulus is beyond 27 millimeter in size, then the sutureless valve, especially in the cohort of bicuspid valve, we shouldn't implant it. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that may be reasonable. I think, you know, when we just say bicuspid valves, it's a huge um, spectrum of bicuspid valves. And so there's a lot of uh, CT scans or, or echocardiograms that say this is a functionally bicuspid, but you have three good posts and the, and the, the equidistant posts from uh, the others are in a good trajectory. I think those are just fine to go ahead and use a sutureless valve for. For those that have a very elong, elongated um, elliptical um, uh, annulus, I think that's where you have to be a little bit careful. And I do agree that once you start getting that past that 27, 29, annulus, uh, millimeter annulus range, then you're starting to get into gray zones on whether that's the right thing to do or not. Um, this, is, this is a good point, the gray zone. Now, uh, if, if, for instance, um, we, we are faced by putting a, a suture valve in a bicuspid aortic valve patients, and we know the majority of the time we operate on these people at a younger stage, uh, especially, you know, having, having that bicuspid aortic valve cohort, they have predisposition to different uh, uh, modality. Eric, what's, what's your take on the long-term durability of that cohort and that use of this valve? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you're asking the right questions, yeah. you know, I mean, Hope so. what, yeah, so it, when the way I see it, there's two issues. There's the technical issues yeah. right. of getting the valve well seated without paravalvular leak and addressing it, and just as you said, there's really a, a broad spectrum of, you know, I use these words, bicuspidness or right. bicuspididity. You know, to to describe, to, right? How right. oh, you like that? Like that. To describe this this uh, this focus, this yeah. heterogeneity in morphology, right. um, and and that we you can address just understanding what the limitations are, and those issues come up for tavern bicuspid That's valve tavern, as right. well, right? right? And then there's the issue of these are newer devices, the longevity, although 
and benchtop testing looks pretty good. We don't really know, um, even in tricuspid positions, how durable they'll be. Uh, that's an important question for us to ask. And so for now, uh, although I think we've, uh, we can sort of decide technically how to get the valve well seated in some patients, I am a bit careful about which bicuspid valve patient I apply the sutureless valves in. Uh, I'll choose, you know, if it's a young person who wants a biologic valve, I'll choose one that has more proven durability over one of these valves just because I'd like to see more data. Mm -hmm. uh, the case I presented at the um, symposium was a patient who was 74 years old. There it was a little easier to choose that personal valve for that guy uh, because, you know, an older patient, we think we're going to get more durability out of a biologic valve. So we have but to tailor it. But you know, Eric, also, what we as surgeons in the community don't, don't, do not generally follow our surgical valve implantation patients. You know, I follow mine on a yearly basis with an echo. I think that as we start doing some of these gray, gray zone procedures, we actually need to have those patients come back, relook at their echoes at 30 days at one year for the rest of their life. And I think that's going to become important for us to get that data because you're right, nobody really has long five, 10 year data on bicuspid valves and, you know, for instance, the personal valve. Uh, yeah, but um, no, no. if we come back to the durability, actually, we had the honor of doing the first Percival in 2007. Mm -hmm. So this year we'll have 10 year results. And till now in about 100 patients in the trial, I've had to replace only one patient due to um, durability problems. So that great. means that- That's great. But, but having said that, the whole patient group was above 75. Right. So we still don't know what happens, let's say, in a 40-year-old. So f as of now, actually, in Hanover, we have a policy that if someone is below 65, we generally do not put in sutureless valves, whether it is Percival or uh, even the intuitive. Well, quite interestingly, that's, that, that age <coughs> limit for just tissue valves, if you're going to put a tissue valve in somebody, then I'm not sure you shouldn't use a sutureless valve potentially in that patient. So I think this is all going to be an area for us to look at very intensely by having long-term fault studies with yearly echoes. Yeah, but I, I, I agree. We, no, yeah. but, yeah. sorry, just, just one point, sorry. Uh, the difference between the other tissue valves and the sutureless valves for me is not only the tissue itself. With the passive right. valve, I still do not know what would happen to the ascending aorta because of the stent absolutely, in the long absolutely. run, in the younger right. patients. Absolutely. And with the uh, intuity, I still don't know what happens with the, with the stent below in, in the long term. Right. Ma Malad, I'm going to stop you on the, on, the, on the tissue, the substrate of tissue. This is very important. Yeah. And as we are leaping now into using, uh, being more sort of like aggressive, if you want, into using sutureless valve and bicuspid aortic valve cohorts, you, would you consider using that? Say, say your data from your trial comes out to say that, you know, of, of course you focused it on, on a certain age group, but would you consider using that uh, in a Marfan patient or in a setting of an acute dissection? Eric, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I would. I think those patients, you have to be really careful. Even in a bicuspid patient without a known described connective tissue disorder, I certainly wouldn't use it in the, in the folks who have that phenotype of annual aortic ectasia and root phenotype. Yeah, I agree. You know, those patients, it's really hard to predict. Uh, in fact, we don't even know really how durable valve replacement with conventional valves is in those folks. So but also, you know, <coughs> Eric, don't you think that also the anus to sinus tubular junction dimensions or diameters won't allow a Percival because a lot of those, the SDJ is completely effaced. Yeah. And those that are starting to get that aorta of four, a four and a half, you're starting to get an effacement of the SDJ and you know, it almost becomes tubular where you may have some issues potentially with any type of valve except being more aggressive with, with removing the aorta and the root. S certainly. Um, again, we need to understand the disease better. Right. There's yeah. no yeah. question yeah. about it. Um, there, there are patients where the root's preserved, the ascending That's aorta's right. dilated, you can recreate right. this sinus tubular junction and get, a, and get a sutureless valve in there and have right. it seated well, um, but we don't, we don't Eric, Eric, you're saying the right thing. So, so say you put an, a, a, a Percival valve or an intimacy in, in a in a setting of a bicuspid aortic valve patient, would you be concerned with the predisposition of those patients, the tissue substrate that Malat mentioned, that they might develop later at later stage in their life, an ascending aorta aneurysm or a root aneurysm? What's 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 your uh, opinion about that? Sure, I mean I always. Well, this is also a technical. What would you do yeah, if right. if a patient comes back to you? So, if, for instance, the, you didn't pick up in in your study, Malak, that none of these patients had actually an ascending uh, aortic aneurysm. But what if they come back to you at a certain point in time 
that they have uh, uh, an ascending or a root aneurysm? What, what, what will you do technically and theoretically? What will you do on that? Um, I think you always have to worry about the ascending yeah. aorta in those folks. And uh, um, so again, it's probably wise to choose the older patient with a bicuspid valve if you're going to do this, because I think once you, you reach that you know, sixth, seventh decade, they've probably already declared themselves as how severe of an aortopathy they're going to have. Right. Anything less than that, you don't know. I mean, I've seen patients have their valve replaced when they're young and develop aortopathy you know, 20, 20 years later. Um, so I'd be really careful about the young patients. Okay, so I agree with that. So we have then a limitation, which is, as, as Eric has mentioned and you agreed with, which is age. And obviously in the literature, there is the ejection fraction, and you all mentioned now the limitation of the annular size. What also, uh, also there for our viewers on CTSnet that you would be worried about, say with an elderly patient, uh, Malak, from your trial, uh, uh, that you would also consider this as a limitation not to in include or involve or implant uh, Percival valve? Well, in elderly patients, I think one group I would be concerned is endocarditis. Mm -hmm. um, I have done some, but um, because you are not putting any sutures, you do not know whether the anchoring will be 100%, so, especially if you are uh, you know, replacing the whole root or when you have to take out the abscess and recreate a new root. Then, then in that group, I would be a little concerned. Otherwise, I think for me, above 70, I'm more or less pro uh, sutureless valves. I think it is the valve of choice now, for me at least, as long as, uh, let's say, the, the root is not too big. Right. Between up to 25, I would... I would think about that. If it is more than that, 28, 29, then it's more a question of whether you want to replace the whole root then. Great. So, so we, we, we kind of like in a nutshell, just to conclude, we've rounded up a limitation setting for, for the people who are listening to us and an indication, which is obviously the age is a predominant one. Um, just as a, as a concluding message, Eric, what would you say for the use of Percival in a bicuspid setting? Um, I think that it's, uh, it's another area of, of potential growth for us to learn. Uh, it's exciting that we have new tools uh, to apply. Um, and I think it's important for us as cardiothoracic surgeons in the cardiovascular community to take this kind of approach uh, as a disease and patient-centric one, yeah. to start to understand the disease first. And then as, uh, as our, the tools that we have become more available and more diversified, then we understand how to apply them better. Okay, great. Uh, Vino, would you like to add anything on that? No, I think that Eric summed it up very nicely. And I think that, you know, as surgeons, we have to start thinking about how we can use all of our tools in addition to open surgical valves and TAVR. And I think the suture list has a nice bridge between those two. We need to really think seriously about how to increase that um, penetrance into our surgical community. My luck, last word. I think I personally think is that if someone is starting with the Percival experience, one should not do it in the bicuspid setting in the beginning. Only it is after you've had some experience with these type of valves, and then only then, then maybe then you should move into that. That's Great. Good yeah. 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 Nice. yeah. So uh, as, as you've heard, the panelists today, they're all uh, asking for caution uh, for the uh, expansion of the use of bicuspid, of Percival valve in a bicuspid aortic valve setting. Uh, we have loads uh, to learn from this, uh, from this uh, entity, uh, and I leave you with that to think about. Anyways, thank you very much for joining us. You've been with Mohammed Bashir for CTSNAT, the Yorkport. Thank you.